All right, we are joined today by H.G. Tudor. How are you doing? I'm very well, Eric. I'm very well indeed. Thank you for inviting me along today. Well, you know what? Thanks for coming. And you've actually been on my radar for a while. Okay. Um, my channel really is a, a lot about behavior. Okay. And as such, I've had like James Fallon on. I'm not mm -hmm. sure if you're familiar with him. Mm -hmm. I know he is, is the uh, psychopath who discovered himself as being a psychopath because of his brain scans that he was studying. That's right. And obviously, I'm interested in narcissism, body language, things like that. And mm -hmm. you're out as a narcissist. Now, is it only that or narcissist and sociopath slash psychopath? I'm described as a narcissistic psychopath. So I have a diagnosis of narcissistic personality disorder and mm -hmm. antisocial personality disorder, which, in other parlance, is described as psychopath. Okay, isn't that redundant? Because from what I understand, every psychopath is a narcissist, but not every narcissist is a socio socio or psychopath. Well, every psychopath will have narcissistic traits, mm -hmm. but may not cross the threshold to be described as a narcissist. So if mm. you're a narcissist, you have NPD, so you cross that threshold. Everybody has narcissistic traits. You have them, of course. I so do. I'm yeah, on YouTube. So, exactly. <laughs> so you have a degree of you, you have a degree of vanity and pride and selfishness sure. and so forth, but they'll invariably be kept in check by your empathic traits of compassion and caring and being a truth seeker and having a moral compass. Now, I don't have any of those empathic traits. So I cross the threshold for narcissistic personality disorder and also antisocial personality disorder. Some people are subclinical. So I would describe them as narcissistic, which means they have some limited emotional empathy, but their narcissistic traits are strong and they've got limited empathic traits. And then you have normal people who have considerable emotional empathy for a, for a small circle of people, their family, their friends and colleagues. Mm -hmm. They have a mix of both empathic and narcissistic traits, but not that strong. Then you have the empath group. They have a wide range of emotional empathy for a wide range of people, and they can have weak narcissistic traits and strong empathic ones, or strong narcissistic traits and even stronger empathic traits, or moderately strong empathic traits and moderate narcissistic traits the point is their empathic traits are always stronger than their narcissistic ones which governs their behavior in an unconscious way so they don't for instance just walk into people's houses and invited and so forth and so they're regulated by that emotional empathy okay interesting and that that brings up some other points and i love to sidetrack because this is just interesting to me mm -hmm. and that is there's empathy and sympathy and that empathy can be crippling to a decision maker. So sometimes it is actually a benefit to have one who lacks empathy, but can intellectually understand or make decisions that are quote for the greater good Absolutely. because they lack the empathy. I, I entirely agree with that approach. And interestingly, uh, prior to this, I was speaking to somebody else and that, that very point uh, came up. And uh, sort of the adopting a utilitarian approach, the greatest good for the greatest number of people, and that you're not held back by uh, emotional empathy and having an emotional decision making uh, process. So a simple example of that might be that you're running a business and you see that Hank is underperforming. And so scoring him on a criteria, you determine that he has to be let go as part of, say, a redundancy procedure. But Hank's been at the company for 25 years and he's got married again for the second time. So some people say, well, you can't really let Hank go. Well, you can because Hank's overpaid for what he's contributing and he's bringing the business down. So he has to go. The emotional decision with emotional empathy is, oh, he's been there a long time and he's just got married. He needs the money. That's not a good mm -hmm. business decision. So unaffected by emotional empathy and recognizing what is good for the company as a whole, you want a decision maker who's not going to be affected by that. Right, which is, that's where it is interesting. It gets into a lot of nuance. You're per, using your example. Mm -hmm. I could go further saying, yes, but Hank's not performing. He's causing problems. Yeah. And therefore, he is limiting the production and harming 10 other employees, let's say. Yeah, well, in and, that scenario, we take him out of the back and shoot him, don't we? 
<laughs> well, not on YouTube. Okay. <laughs> Hypothetically speaking, Eric. <laughs> Ah, uh, yes, because that's we're going to be going down that path about uh, terms of services and uh, brigading and mass mm -hmm. flagging and okay. all these other um, fun activities from Absolutely. bad players who probably yes. will paint you with the brush, but you've already painted yourself, and that has to be useful in some ways. Well, it does. I, I am honest about what I am, which is more than can be said for certain bad actors on YouTube. Agreed. <laughs> and and I know we're bearing the lead with Christopher Boozy, but I definitely like talking about who people are and the channels mm -hmm. and things like that and not just be like, oh, it's a anti Boozy or anti Meg no, or no. anything else. It's that's tedious to the start. Mm -hmm. But one more point I wanted to explore, because I'm not making it, I don't genuinely know, about narcissism mm -hmm. is there is a general perception that narcissism means an extreme amount of vanity or arrogance but i've come to understand that that's not quite accurate that it's really about everything is about the individual yes and as i explain narcissism as you know it's described as a personality disorder mm -hmm. and the narcissist either aware, which is the rarer group, or unaware, which is a much larger, more common group, seek what I've categorized as the prime aims. And that means control, fuel, character traits, and residual benefits. A narcissist needs those four things, not from everybody that we interact with. So let's take you and I, for example. Mm -hmm. You are on my radar because mm -hmm. we're having a conversation. Therefore, my narcissism must act to control you. Well, that's easy because you're asking me questions. We're having a pleasant conversation. You're not saying, so here's H.G. Tudor. He's absolutely full of himself and he talks a load of nonsense. You're not being rude to me. So you're asking me questions. We're having a discussion. So you are under control. You don't feel controlled. So it's a win-win. You and I don't know one another. We've had some limited interaction over email. I've watched a few hmm. of your videos in the past, found them very interesting. And you're what's known as a tertiary source in my fuel matrix. Effectively, you're a, an acquaintance of mine. And so the fuel that comes from you, your emotional responses to me are of low potency. But the fact is, because I can see you, I can see the look in your eye, your facial expression, you nod when you comprehend the point that I've made, you smile when I crack a joke. So you're giving me some fuel, and it's pure positive fuel, so everything's lovely. Now, at this juncture, I don't need any character traits from you. But it might be that we discuss something, Eric, which I log and think, well, that was quite useful. And then I have a conversation elsewhere, and I pass off what you've told me as something that's been intrinsic to my experience. A little bit like, uh, for instance... Uh, an individual might go and watch a television program that shows an attendance in a Korean spa and then pass that off as their own experience when they are having a discussion with somebody. Okay, that's character trait acquisition. Another example might be, let's say this morning my friend flew in from Rome, and although I've been to Rome many times, let's assume I haven't, and he tells me about how he had a great time throwing a coin into the Trevi Fountain, and he had his picture taken on the Spanish steps, and he went to the Colosseum. And then I chat to somebody else, and I say, yes, I had a great time in Rome recently. Um, I threw a coin in the Trevi Fountain so that I'd return, and I, I went and had an ice cream on the Spanish steps, etc. I never went but I've passed their experience off as my own. That's character trait acquisition. And then finally, we have residual benefits. That could be managing the facade. So for instance, if you didn't know what I was, we just had a good conversation, you could go off and say, yeah, HG Tudor, great chap. You know, I had a really good conversation. I've managed that facade so that you tell other people that I'm a decent human being. Residual benefits might be access to networks. It could be sheer pleasure. So when having sex with somebody, the pleasure one gets from one's nerve endings being touched and rubbed, etc. That is a residual benefit. Money is a big one. Money is a big residual benefit. So when we interact with people, we seek at least one of those things, control, usually two, control and fuel, and sometimes three and four character traits and residual benefits. And that's essentially what the narcissist is about. And our behaviors are all framed to enable us to get to those things, which means we act with a sense of entitlement. We have no emotional empathy, but we might have cognitive empathy. We lack accountability for behaviors. We might, but not always, exhibit grandiosity. 
we exhibit magical thinking. We may be haughty, but again, not always. Some narcissists aren't necessarily haughty. We have an array of manipulations, ranging from future faking, triangulation, false compassion, use of guilt, denial, provocation, insult, destruction of property, the revision of history, on and on the go. We don't have boundary recognition. And there are various facets of the narcissistic dynamic that are exhibited. So we might monopolize people's time. We engage in mirroring. We utilize what's called abusive X syndrome. We talk about our immediate ex. Oh, she abused me so that the person we're talking to feels sorry for us. So the narcissist manifests with all of those different behaviors, but they're there to help the narcissist pursue those prime aims that I've mentioned. This video is being sponsored by HelloFresh. You've probably heard of them as they are America's number one meal kit. They offer over 50 weekly options, giving an amazing amount of variety of recipes so you'll never get bored. They even have veggie, pescatarian, and fit and wholesome meals to make it easy to stick to your goals. With HelloFresh, step-by-step -step recipes are super easy to follow and pre-portioned ingredients help cut out the prep time. It's also up to 72% cheaper than dining at a restaurant, according to Zagat. To try HelloFresh, just click the link below and you'll get 17 free meals across seven boxes, plus three surprise gifts. Thank you very much. And thanks to HelloFresh for sponsoring this video. So essentially you have basic human traits without a governor. In a sense. Um, I, I like to refer to you as our friendly neighborhood narcissist mm -hmm. and have in different I'll chats. I'll take that. That's quite all right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so as such, you've done some videos on, let's say, the royal family. Yes. And from what I have seen and heard, you're essentially just taking the frame of, this is who I am, this is how I see things, and I see people acting in this manner similar to me. So you're kind of not exactly diagnosing, but relating as much as possible without empathy. I'm going to talk myself out of this hole here in a minute, but uh, comparing yourself to others or, or putting yourself as a mirror to others to help us understand them. Is that fair? In essence, I understand my form of narcissism and psychopathy is such that I have insight. I know what I am. Mm -hmm. Now I certainly don't go around and immediately walk into a shop and go, hello, let's say I'm called John Smith. I'm not, but hi, my name's John Smith and I'm a narcissistic psychopath. That would be an idiotic thing to do. So in my private life, I don't admit what I am. That's why you can't see me, and that's why I operate under a pseudonym. So I can tell you all about this. And so what I do is I let all of those that are interested in what I write on my blog and what I talk about on my YouTube channel understand what my worldview is, the way that I see the world, the way that I think, the way that I function, the way that I operate. And I also, because I've had such extensive experience with other types of narcissists, tell you what they're thinking, what they're seeing, what they're doing. And this enables people to make sense of things in their own lives, with a romantic partner, with their father, with their brother, with a boss. Mm -hmm. And I do all of that to extend my legacy of being the world's best provider of information about narcissism. And so what I do in order to help people understand, I'm not a psychologist, so I don't use scientific terms because I find them largely unhelpful for people who are trying to understand. And instead, what I do is I talk about the behaviors of an individual and explain why they're behaving as they are seen through the prism of their narcissism. Now, all people, for example, could hit another human being. That doesn't make you a narcissist. What we do is we look at a range of behaviors over a sustained period of time, and where we have a multiplicity of indicators, that's determinative of what that person is. And then, having established what they are, we are then able to interpret their behavior. So what I've done with the royal family, in one particular prominent example, because she is the gift that keeps on giving, <laughs> is I identified using my expertise as to what she is. Now, many people go, I'm on board with that. That makes sense to me. Other people go, oh, you're just a nasty, hater, racist man. No, I'm not. I'm just describing behavior. It's as simple as that. And if you don't like it, you don't have to listen. It really doesn't trouble me if you don't. That actually leads to a question. Uh, Certainly. That. When you're um, describing what you are uh, for people, yes. but you're... You don't have empathy. So it's an interesting scenario. 
are you in fact doing it for the grandiosity of being the number one guy who's dispelling the information on it versus the benefit of helping other people and getting any kind of joy or fulfillment out of that? I do it because I need control. And the biggest threat to my control is death. Mm. Because at some point, I will shuffle off this mortal coil. Won't be any time soon. My meat suit that I'm in is lovely. <laughs> There's plenty of mileage in it yet, Eric. However, I will die. And that's it. It's game over. And that's a huge threat to my sense of control, because what can I do about that? Sure, I exercise, I eat well, I don't smoke, I drink, but I'm not an alcoholic. I look after myself, so I will have longevity. But ultimately, my body will wear out. Assuming that I'm not killed in an accident or uh, an act of warfare or such like, I'll live on to a certain age and then I'll pass away. But that's going to happen. And whilst I can extend it, I can't avoid it. So what I can do, however, is deal with that risk to control by knowing that at the point the Grim Reaper appears with his adamantine scythe and says, that's it, Judah, it's over for you. I know at that point that my legacy will live on because of my videos, my books. There'll be millions of people that have accessed my work and will still talk about me once I've gone. And who knows, by that stage, there might be Tudor Academies set up. That's something I've been in discussions with venture capitalists about. So who knows where to go. But this is why I'm doing it. It's not because I care. It's not because I want people to think, oh, isn't that kind of him to tell us all this information? I'm doing it because it serves my purposes. It allows me to nullify a threat to control. Yes, I gain fuel from doing it, but that's not the primary reason. Yes, I gain character traits. But that's not the primary reason. And yes, I get residual benefits because I get paid and I make a, an income from my videos and the consultations and the books that I sell. But again, that's not the primary reason. The primary reason I do this is to nullify that threat to control by creating a legacy. Also, there's a lot of misinformation about narcissism and that irritates me. And that also is a threat to control. Because I'm something of an intellectual snob and I don't like stupidity. People who perhaps don't understand and they want to understand, that's great. I welcome that. You want to learn? Come on into the Tuna University and I'll teach you all day and help you understand. But where pe people go around trotting out the misunderstandings about narcissism, I find that offensive and that threatens my sense of control. So another part of this, Eric, is to get rid of the misunderstandings about narcissism because too much information is either incomplete or wrong and I'm remedying that. And there is, of course, as you've rightly picked up on, there will be a degree, you describe it as grandiosity, I just describe it as the way that it is, of being the best at the delivery of the information. Okay. Now, I did want to get back to it. I just wanted to cover that. And actually, I have one sure. more. HG Tutor. Uh, yes. One, you were saying tutor and tutor, which is an interesting play on words, the so Tutor Tutoring Academy. But mm -hmm. what inspired that particular pseudonym? The surname is that I have an historical link to the Tudor dynasty in England through tracing my family. And with the HG, that actually links to two of my initials, but nobody will ever guess what they are. So, because I have quite an unusual name. So, but I like to say to the people that it stands for Holy Grail or Huge Gonads or Hurt God or whatever you want it to be, or He's Great or such like. But uh, that's what's behind it. It's linked to the lineage, and it's also linked to my actual name. Okay, perfect. So now to pivot back. I'm assuming, when we're talking about individual, mm -hmm. that we are probably discussing Meghan Markle. Mm -hmm. I don't think it would be Prince Harry, personally, because I don't quite peg him as a narcissist. No. I peg him as more of a mark. But that's mm -hmm. in my opinion. Okay. Are, am I correct? We are speaking of Meghan Markle, and can you mm -hmm. describe what you see? And okay, so I was probably amongst the first to describe her as being a narcissist, and I did so after extensively utilizing a range of information, some of which is in the public domain, some of which was private to me, and based upon my own experiences, also. And so that range of material. I am not quick to label somebody as a narcissist 
one has to look at all of the available evidence and material. And anybody who has listened to my evaluations on my channel will know, possibly they might even sometimes say, gosh, he goes on a bit. But it's a rigorous process of assessment. And I looked at all of that and formed the view that she is a narcissist. And then I did a video, probably uh, around about four years ago, just over four years ago, about when she was about to get married. Now, I'd already formed the view some time before that that she was a narcissist, but I did the video. Uh, it was called A Very Royal Narcissist Part One. And that got a lot of interest. And then I didn't do anything more about it. And I carried on doing all of the other work on my channel, my consultations and everything else in my private life. And then I did a follow-up to it. And then I did another one. And then it became apparent that not only uh, is she an excellent teaching tool, because one, lots of people have an interest in her for a variety of different reasons. Mm -hmm. But two, you just can't avoid her for two reasons. One, because of her narcissism, she has to assert control over the populace by repeatedly appearing either on television, in the broadcast news, or more commonly in what I call PR puff pieces, which have been paid for in the likes of certain magazines, both online and in physical print. So she causes that to happen to enable her to assert control over an audience and draw fuel from their responses and to manage her facade because she truly believes that she's a kind and decent empathic person. Also, the news media loves reporting about her because they know it sells advertising space and it gets clicks. And I've seen it myself. I can create a video which gives you life-saving information about narcissism. And it gets maybe the first 48 hours, eight, 10,000 views. I can then do something about Harry's wife and it suddenly racks up 60,000 views. And it shows the level of interest <laughs> that exists. True. So... It, would, it behooves me to utilize something that people are interested in so that, one, I can teach them about narcissism because that's what my channel is about. It's not about bashing Harry's wife. I actually find her tedious and boring, but she's a very good teaching tool because of her need to be in the news and because the news likes to portray her. So she is spoken about a lot. We have, of course, vast tracts of the internet that are given over to debating the things that she does. Yeah. My particular corner of the internet is about her narcissism. With other people, it's just generally, she's a horrible person. Other people, oh, I love what she wears. Where do we buy those clothes? Other people are supportive of her. Other people just think, you know, they have their theories about whether the children exist and so on and so forth. <laughs> and people are allowed to express those opinions, both pro and con, in relation to her. True. So that obviously has put you on the radar mm -hmm. of, um, shall we say, people who are fans mm -hmm. of Meghan Markle. Mm -hmm. And what has come out of that? One of these specifically, I don't know if I would call him a fan of hers or an opportunist. Mm. And that's Christopher Boozy. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, let me start with the Sussex squad. Occasionally, one will one or two wander onto my channel. And they stand a mile out because, like some particular uh, bird, they have a particular call, which will be, you don't know her, or leave her alone, or you're just a hating, racist, colonial imperialist. Actually, they probably don't say that one. There's too many long words in it. So it's just basically, <laughs> you're a hater and you're a racist. So they stand out a mile, and invariably their standard of English is poor. And I either ignore them, which is my way of nullifying that threat to control posed by their accusation, or I simply set them straight by saying, you say that I'm a racist. This is a channel about narcissism. Let me detail for you the people that I have examined. Donald Trump, Shane Dawson, Alec Baldwin, Hillary Baldwin, Taylor Swift, Amber Heard, um, Kevin Spacey, Harvey Weinstein, Brian Laundry, Chris Watts, and I list them all, Derek Jackson, so on and so forth. And I say, do you notice anything about that list? 
The bulk of them are white and male. So now explain to me how a channel about narcissism is one where I'm being racist. I never, ever get a response from them. And the reason for that is, and I don't expect one either. When I give that answer, it's not for their benefit. It's to Mm -hmm. other people looking. And I don't get an answer because they either are a bot, and therefore it does not compute, or it's beyond their comprehension to enter into a constructive discussion with me about it, and they just run away. There we are. They are entitled to express their opinion. Of course they are. But it's not a very well-formed one, as I've just demonstrated. So occasionally they wander in, and they're not particularly persistent, and then they wander away. They may well mutter and grind their teeth and moan about me elsewhere. I don't know. I've got better things to do than be looking around on the internet for what they're up to. But those are the ones that directly come across my path. They never email me to lambast me. It's just occasionally a comment on YouTube. They don't appear on my blog. I suspect that's because reading is too difficult for many of them. And instead, it's just easier to listen to what's being said. They clearly don't listen very well because they invariably write things which are at odds with what I've said. So what they do is they basically see that I'm talking about Harry's wife, and therefore they assume that it's uh, not complimentary, and therefore they make the great big leap of logic that that makes me a racist when it's not. I've explained many times before, Eric, I don't have any prejudices. I hate everybody equally. That's the way that I am. So that's the Sussex squad. Now, about Mr. Boozy... I believe that I came upon his radar as a consequence of another YouTuber putting a screenshot up on her channel and Schoolgirl Error left various tabs open on the screenshot, one of which was my blog or YouTube site. And Boozy, scrutinizing that, saw, who's this HG Tudor? And then, again, because I've no interest in seeing what he has to write about me, Other people, my valuable viewers, told me there's this boozy character uh, making uh, various comments about you, HG. You're on his radar. Watch out. Okay. And basically, he was saying that he was going to unmask me. Well, good luck with that, uh, because you won't find anything. And what you do find are just proxies. Uh, I protect my identity. So everything I do is legitimate but it's done in a way which ensures that I am allowed to express my views about narcissism whilst protecting my identity, because it would cause problems for me in my personal life if people knew that I'm a narcissistic psychopath. So, and the vast majority of people respect that because they recognize your information saves lives, HG. It saves livelihoods. I have chock full folders of testimonials, Eric, about how my work has helped people. And so they respect the fact that I choose to remain anonymous. With Boozy, he threatened, I think, a year ago to expose my identity, and there was various things I understand posted on Twitter. Uh, I think he was, sc- I think he was possibly uh, scouring over my Instagram account and looking at certain photographs uh, and saying that it showed certain things. And uh, well, you, you, if you want to waste your time doing that, you do that. I have much better things to be doing. And I appeared on a hit list, which I, and I got mentioned in a couple of British newspapers, I think last October, around the time of people such as Yankee Wally were getting targeted, and uh, I think, is it uh, uh, Sue Smith or such like? And mm-hmm. he was trying to get people booted off Twitter, and we had the whole thing of the Twitter hit list. Now, I'm not that prominent on Twitter. I have a Twitter account, but it generally just has my blog articles fed onto it, and then they're posted. And... Uh, but these people obviously were being silenced for expressing their opinion, which is wrong. And, of course, they were being targeted in a manner which was also wrong. And I don't know to what extent I have been targeted, because, again, I see on my Twitter I get a few comments from the Sussex squad on there. I just ignore them. I don't know what overtures they've made to try and have my channel taken down. If they have, they haven't succeeded, because it's a channel about narcissism. It's, that's, it's that simple. It's not a channel about bullying anybody. It's not a channel about uh, harassing anybody. It is explaining a range of behaviours so people understand. And yes, I've got a lot of videos about Harry's wife because she's so prominent. But if, for example, I did a lot on Amber Heard before she went quiet, 
And if there were other people that kept appearing in the news and that so many people were interested in, I would do videos about them. I've no particular axe to grind with Harry's wife. None whatsoever. She just serves a purpose for me as a teaching tool. Fair enough. Another name just popped in my head. Did you say Jada Pinkett Smith by chance? Yes. Uh, well, I didn't, but I have dealt with her. I have undertaken an analysis of her in the past, and I did an extensive series about her and also Will Smith. So what I did was I determined, uh, I asked, I reviewed her behavior to explain what she is, and then I did the same with Will Smith. Okay. Um, am I correct that she may be on the spectrum? She's a narcissist, yes. He's not. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, just a guess. <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, and out of curiosity, what would you make of Boozy himself from the actions you've seen? Well, he does operate with a sense of entitlement, whereby he decides it's fair game to attack other people. And mm -hmm. um, from what I have seen from material that's provided to me by other people, that often there's a disconnect between what he is saying and what the evidence shows. He also demonstrates lack of boundary recognition at times because, for instance, he has doxed people where it was unnecessary to do so. He scurries around looking for information about people, and I understand in some instances does so erroneously, so he cl makes claims about certain people, and the information is wrong. And I know I follow to an extent, obviously, Nate's situation oh, yeah. with him. So, And I know you've spoken at length with Nate. I, I uh, watched your uh, discussion and interview together. So he shows a lack of accountability for his behaviours, because what he does is he engages in the very behavior that he criticizes other people for, namely going around th throwing mud at other individuals. And he accuses other people of doing that. And it would appear that there's an absence of emotional empathy in much of his behavior because he, he makes a determination in his world as to what is acceptable or unacceptable behavior and then makes it a personal crusade to get people, in effect, canceled at his say-so. And last time I looked, I didn't see that the universe had decided that Christopher Boozy was the grand arbiter of taste, morals, or decision-making. Or brains. I'm sorry. Well, That's there is that mind. also, indeed. <laughs> but so there are many behaviors which one would say are questionable with regard to the way that he has conducted himself. He, of course, deems that he's on a form of moral crusade. And in his world, he honestly believes that. And it seems to me that he lacks insight into determining evidence from the other side. And he molds things to fit his narrative without necessarily having due regard to what all the evidence actually states. And, of course, gets involved in these Twitter spats with people and has found himself, uh, you know, we saw the instance, as I understand, that he filed for bankruptcy to avoid making a rent payment, if that, mm -hmm. I understand that correctly. That could well be interpreted as an avoidance of accountability, failure to pay money that's owed. I also understand that there's a suggestion that there was a failure on his part to declare certain interesting companies at the point of the mm -hmm. declaration of bankruptcy, if I followed correctly what Nate has unearthed. Again, that would suggest a sense of entitlement, a lack of accountability, an absence of emotional empathy for the person who isn't going to get paid who should have received a rent payment. So there are indicators of behavior there which are questionable. Interesting. I'd be curious, and, you know, I'm, obviously you're going to find whatever's interesting to you or whatever. Mm. I see Christopher Boozy as the pointy end of a much larger problem. Mm. And that is the people who use his information by that. And I will name Taylor Lorenz, Kat Tinbarge, the Rolling Stone, or sorry, Rolling Stone magazine, mm -hmm. etc. I'm curious, and this would be just you know for your own self preservation, etc. Because they are, we'll call it old media attacking new media. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what a lot of this is. Have you looked into some of these people, like Taylor Lorenz, who's a great example of a cry bully who comes from a very elite background? and manipulates stories and people in a manner that would make Chris Boozy proud. 
That's not a name I'm familiar with, but I've just made a note nevertheless. It's piqued my interest to take a look. Um, many people contact me, Eric, and say, will you look at this person? Will you look sure, at that sure. person? And there's own, I'm an army of one in that regard, mm -hmm. and I have other things that I must attend to. I could spend all day doing analyses of famous and infamous people, and I'm pleased that people are interested. Um, basically, there are situations where what can happen is that an individual who um, is, to say, a narcissist can engage the services of somebody else effectively as a hired gun. And so for, I call them lieutenants. So I have lieutenants that essentially are utilized to do my bidding. Now, sometimes they will do bidding because there might be an adverse consequence if they don't, or there's an inducement or a reward. Mm -hmm. So, And that's commonly the case, that money is utilized so that the lieutenant is on the receipt of that reward, so they will go and do certain things for that governing power, who invariably is a narcissist because they're operating in a way that is absent of accountability, they are asserting control, nullifying threats to control, and so forth. And so there are instances where individuals will essentially get that hired gun. And of course, this has always gone on. It's done in the politics game. It's done by businesses. You know, mm -hmm. it's done by those that argue for climate change and those that say that climate change is a myth. If you want to, I, it always puts me in mind of, there's a, there's a, um, a particular skit that was done if Google were a guy on YouTube, which is very entertaining. And there's one where basically he sits, he's an actor who, uh, He's appeared in a number of things, but he's in this YouTube video. I think it's College Humor that does them. But mm. he sits there, and everybody comes in as if they were typing it into Google. And this lady basically says, um, the MMR jab causes autism. And he says, well, I've got a thousand results that say no and one that says yes. And she takes the one that says yes, and she says, I knew it. <laughs> and basically, if you want to go and find somebody that will support your point of view, either because you terrify them into doing it or you promise a reward or you pay them to do it you can go and find that attack dog anywhere you like and of course we see this that has always gone on in terms of find that sympathetic research company find that pr outfit that will massage things but now with the with the internet and the new media it becomes uh, something that's done faster and is done more regularly by certain individuals in order to silence certain groups of people and promote others very true and i'm i guess conspiracy minded but i just see a definitive parallel here of old media versus new media that channels such as yours even mm -hmm. to a small degree mine and others are directly threatening because we the only thing you mentioned it before you're going to die mm -hmm. one thing you can't control is time and if people are not spending time on your content, they're spending it somewhere else, mm -hmm. this becomes critical. So the person I mentioned, Taylor Lorenz, mm -hmm. as an example, went after a TikTok manager okay. with the assistance of her um, book agent, as in writing a book. Mm -hmm. That agent is an old school, I don't know if it was William Morris or somebody like that, but it was an old school agency in Hollywood. Yes. How big is, is TikTok in terms of threats to Hollywood? Huge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you have this, where you have an um, old term agency going after an agent of new up and coming talent in a new forum that's pulling attention away through a book deal, which is again, old media publishing world with the reporter, Taylor Lorenz at that time at the New York Times, the gray lady, old mm -hmm. media again. Now she's at the Washington Post. Mm -hmm. And I do think that there's just a little more here than this person's an ass. Mm -hmm. There's a you may, you may well be right. I haven't seen the evidence, so I can't comment one way or the other. But as a an observation that people uh, might be puppeteering other individuals to do their will, well, of course that happens. Okay, well, perfect. And I hope you check it out. But to close this out, I have one more question. Certainly. What question should I have asked that I neglected to?
where would people find all of my material if they'd be interested in learning more about my work? Nice play. All right. HD Tutor um, on YouTube, correct? Mm -hmm. So you can find me at HD Tutor, Knowing the Narcissist, the Ultra on YouTube. I also have a blog with hundreds, if not thousands now, of written articles, all gratis, similar to that of my work on YouTube. Uh, that's called Narcsite, N-A-R-C-S-I-T-E dot com. And that work feeds out onto Facebook, which is also HGT Knowing the Narcissist, similar name on Instagram, and similar on Twitter also. So there are various platforms that you can find my work. And if you want to be educated whilst being entertained, I'd encourage people to access that. And if they may well realize that they've got a narcissist in the family or they've got a narcissist in a relationship, and they will not only learn so much more, and practical ways of dealing with all of that. But actually, it also provides you with a key to understanding much about human behavior. If we go back to the very thing that you opened with, Eric, about having an interest in human behavior, when you recognize narcissists and understand the way that narcissists function and operate, the way that we are, it really does give you a key to understanding much of the world. Because after a while, you suddenly realize, now I know why that customer of mine couldn't be pleased. I wouldn't have wasted as much time on them if I'd known all of this. Ah, that's why that politician never answers the question, because it threatens his innate need for control, so he has to keep deflecting and he never ATQs. And so it enables you to understand why on earth did Adam Levine be sending all of those messages to all of those women on Instagram when he's got uh, two lovely children and a beautiful wife? What possessed the man to behave? Ah, now I understand what was going on there. So it really does give you a magnificent, great, big, gold, shiny key, courtesy of me, the ultra, to understanding human behavior. Oh, perfect. And thank you very much, sir. You're welcome.